Saint Mother Teresa's life was an event which revolutionized the way the world is and continues to view and meet the needs of the poorest of the poor. She acted on their plight. She taught us and mobilized and inspired sisters, brothers, priests, and volunteers in the cause of assisting the poorest of the poor. She changed the way nations of the world perceived the poorest of the poor. Through this production, we have an opportunity to get a first-hand view of 25 years of her apostolate and the mission of Father William Petrie. Father William is a priest who served as a missionary with Mother Teresa in the cause of the poorest of the poor and had his own ministry in India as a priest with the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary. We begin with an introduction of Father Petrie, followed by his witness to that 25-year experience. Father Petrie was ordained in North Fairhaven, Massachusetts in 1969. Father Petrie chose to follow the footsteps of his role model, Saint Father Damien the Leper. However, Father found that when he entered Father Damien's community, his congregation no longer operated a leper hospital. Patiently, he worked at Regina Pontius Center in New Bedford and at Our Lady of Assumption Church in New Bedford and at his community's house in Boston. He learned about Mother Teresa and that she had built a leper colony 125 miles from Calcutta. Father obtained permission to enter India as a consultant in occupational rehabilitation for lepers. He wrote to Mother Teresa. Despite no response, Father went to India and although not knowing the language, managed to make his way to Mother Teresa. He became the resident priest at Shanti Nagar, Mother Teresa's leper colony. It was a quiet life, a refuge to which some patients with advanced leprosy literally crawled for miles to reach. He found that the greatest pain of leprosy is rejection by family, friends, and community. It's the complications of the disease that develop that often prematurely end the lives of lepers. Father also found that even though medications are effective to arrest the disease, today cure it, the stigma of leprosy remained, so homes and employment opportunities were needed in the leprosy colonies to enable sufferers and their families to gain self-sufficiency. Father Petrie's amazing journey, including privileged conversation with Mother Teresa, follow. Could you tell us who inspired you? When I was 16 years old, a junior in high school in Phoenix, Arizona, on the day of recollection that Jesuits were sponsoring, our talks were maybe three or four a day, and in between we went to our homeroom class, and um, my teacher shared the book, Damien the Leper by John Farrell. And it was that book that really inspired me about the person of Damien. And why is that, Father? Now, I think it was the work of the Holy Spirit. Simple as that. Uh, his generosity, his um, history, uh, his determination, his zeal, and above all, his prayerfulness and holiness. Why is it that you chose to be a missionary for those who are suffering from Hansen's disease or leprosy? I think it was the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, one time when I was at the, the Shanti Nagar Leprosy Center, the uh, engineers were there who helped construct that building, and they asked me, how could you leave the United States and come here? We couldn't even live out here, in the middle of nowhere, uh, no transportation, uh, hardly any electricity, no running water. And I was thinking what answer to give, and then the superior came in and she heard the question. She said, 
he can do it because God loves him. Okay. And that was my reason, I think, I responded to God's love. How did you find out about Mother Teresa? I was in the seminary in our library and there was a magazine that had a story of Mother Teresa and this goes way back to 1965. Mm -hmm. um, Mother Teresa started the order in 1950 and um, it just mentioned this new society, missionary society, um, Mother Teresa the foundress and working with the poorest of the poor and I just had that in the back of my mind. Now the article was dealing with a mass at Christmas time in which hundreds of leprosy patients attended. So that was the connection, leprosy, Mother Teresa. So share with me how you wound up going to India. Well, it was a process. Remember, I had the desire, in, it was 1958 I entered the seminary. And it wasn't until 1975 that it was going to materialize. So wow. it was um, a, a process that was constantly being renewed in my heart and mind. You call those new beginnings? New beginnings, correct. How would you define what these new beginnings were in the context of your ministry? Whenever there was a new project, whenever someone new came into your life, it was always a new beginning. So the situation here, it's a new beginning, new people. And uh, it's just open to the spirit what happens when your presence and the interaction takes place. Tell us the story, please, of how it is that you met Mother Teresa. Well, I had permission to visit India just to find out if my dreams were real. Could I fit in? Could I have a role in the leprosy apostle of Mother Teresa? Would she accept me? So I got the permission for three months in 1973 and I uh, raised the money to the parish because I had to do that to pay for the ticket and the parishioners, as poor as the parish was, raised a couple hundred dollars more than the ticket. So I sent it to Mother Teresa. And uh, I told her about me coming for her to be a volunteer. She never responded, no acknowledgement. I wrote another letter, and again, no response. And finally, I wrote my last letter saying what day, what time, what flight I would be arriving in Calcutta. Arrived, and no one was there to meet me. I was told I had to leave the airport because it was closing. I was recommended to go to a lodge in town and the following morning looked up Mother Teresa's address in the phone book, called. I said, my name is Father Petrie. I am from the United States. I belong to the same missionary order as Father Damien, the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary. And I would like to speak to Mother Teresa about volunteering in her leprosy work for three months. The voice on the other side of the phone said, this is Mother Teresa, come right over. <laughs> Very simple. Very simple. You arrived in Kolkata and what was your first impression of the place? The um, Pakistan-Bangladesh war had just ended. There were over a million refugees who poured into Calcutta. A million? A million. And they were on the, off the highway between um, the airport and the center of town. It was about 20 miles. Mm -hmm. And going through that mass humanity, I couldn't believe it. Just seeing people who were living with the clothes on their back, uh, the plastic tents, the uh, food everyone was cooking in the open fires, the uh, soldiers with guns. And in that throng, 
saw a group of leprosy patients huddled together, and that convinced me there is work here. When you first saw that, did you have second thoughts? <laughs> I had second thoughts when no one met me at the airport. <laughs> But it was temporary, because after I saw that group of leprosy patients, I said, no, thank you, Lord, for testing me. <laughs> so let's move on. So here it is. You show up uh, at the mother house. Uh, you uh, uh, are, are greeted by Mother Teresa. What was it like? I think it was a special grace in this sense. There was an immediate connection. Is there such a thing as chemistry between people? Is it two vibrations that connect? Is it um, uh, a kindred spirit in some way? Or all of the above? And that was my experience. And so she said, uh, you're here, I'm putting you to work. <laughs> she said, go to the bishop's house and get faculties because you'll say mass tomorrow at the house of the dying. So in those days, uh, going from one diocese to another, especially one country to another, that was necessary. And she made arrangements for me to stay with the Missionary of Charity Brothers. You actually wound up spending 25 years in India. Which seemed like 25 weeks in <laughs> India. Yeah. How would you summarize the various new beginnings that you had while in India? Okay. Well, my first experience of the three months was an overview. Overview of the work, seeing the culture, um, being with Mother Teresa, accompanying her in the vehicle as she went to mobile clinics, visit the elderly, the children, the dying. Uh, then it was actually going to Shanti Nagar and being in this place. And as soon as I got there, it was 40 acres of land. I felt this is sacred ground. And that was my experience, sacred ground, and I'm here. And I'm probably going to spend the rest of my life here. But it wasn't to be. So after three months, I returned to the States. And then um, I was asked to wait another year before uh, being able to go, which I did. And uh, then it was, when there is a new beginning, it follows a neutral time. Neutral time. Okay. Yes. So what you have to have is a good ending, a neutral time, and then another new beginning. So for going to India, it was a conclusion of my work in the United States, working in the parish for five years. The neutral time was in between leaving and going, which was um, several months because I did some training in the States, and then the new beginning, the day I landed in India. How did she go from the Sisters of Loreto to becoming the Missionaries of Charity? She was 19 years a Sister of Loreto. She was assigned to one of their schools in Calcutta, she had picked up the Bengali language and she was principal of the Bengali students. She was going on a retreat in Darjeeling, up at the base of the Himalayas. Uh, the sisters had a, a school and retreat house there. On the way, it was September 10th, 1946. She got an inspiration. And she couldn't believe that she would get such an idea to be the founders of an order of sisters who were going to work with the poorest of the poor, who were going to fo uh, follow sort of an Indian spirituality. And um, she thought to herself, I'm happy as a sister of Loretto. I'm fulfilled. But she went through the process of sharing that inspiration. What happened, everyone had doubts whether she was capable of such a thing. But those refugees were in Calcutta. The church was overwhelmed. The government was overwhelmed. 
non-governmental organizations were overwhelmed. And so the church was only too happy to recommend her to work with the poorest of the poor, which entailed these refugees. And it is not easy to establish a new no. order. No. What kind of process did she have to go through to organize such a move? She went to visit the American medical missionaries in India to learn about basic medicine. Okay. After a year there, she came back to Calcutta and she went to live with the Little Sisters of the Poor. Okay. They, uh, in firm in age. Yes. And then she went off by herself on the streets with a little kit with bandages, medicine, vitamins, and pills. Her former students found out about this and they wanted to join her. And so after about a year, the first five was allowed to actually move into an accommodation she was able to get and begin the work. Did they continue to come that way or were others attracted and came from other places? The power of the presence with the poor is quite a, an experience. But with that experience was a prayer life. Okay. So Mother Teresa would say, we are not social workers. Everything that we do, we do for Jesus. And there was a balance in the life of that first group between prayer and going out into the streets. Coming back, prayer, going back into the streets. Coming back, prayer, an hour adoration at night, and a preparation for the next day. Mother Teresa was not happy to have a candidate who just wanted to do hands-on work. She saw the vocation for the followers of her of being a spouse of Christ, of consecrating your life totally to Christ through a life of prayer, which overflowed into the different projects for the poor. So what she had was the ability to combine both, and that's what attracted the girls, I the see. prayer life as well as the work. So here it is, uh, you have a, a sister who is um, from Albania, uh, who comes to India and says, I want to do this work. It's primarily a Hindu country uh, with this inf uh, infusion of uh, immigrants uh, or uh, people who Refugee. are displaced. Most of them were Hindus leaving that Muslim. And a small number of, of Christians in yes. Bengal. How did she navigate that aspect of it in a, in a country that is primarily different in terms of religion? Okay. We say a religious order has a charism. Charism is what gifts comes from the Greek word charis. And Mother Teresa's charism was based on two scripture passages. Okay. One was, whatsoever you do to the least of my brethren, you've done for me. So that's the hands-on. The hands-on, okay. The second scripture passage was when Jesus was on Calvary and he says, I thirst. And so Mother would tell the sisters, we want to quench the thirst of Jesus on the cross by serving the poorest of the poor. And that was done in conjunction with going into not only Eucharistic prayer, the daily mass, the adoration. I see. At the time, she has a few students that join her. It grows a bit, establishes herself in, uh, in India. Today, uh, there are over 5,500 uh, sisters. Uh, there are some close to 500 brothers, uh, priests who are missionaries of char charity. Um, how did that happen? It um, grew out of, if Mother Teresa was the root of a branch, mm -hmm. these were branches that automatically came. So that while Mother was able to do what she was doing with girls, 
there was a need to have young men mm -hmm. working with the uh, destitute elderly men, uh, street children, boys, teenagers, and so volunteers came again and that started. Um, she needed spiritual help for mass, teaching the charism of the congregation, and that led some priests who wanted to follow Mother Teresa's charism as MC fathers who would be available to work with the sisters sacramentally mm -hmm. and also as a support uh, for retreats, for ongoing education, and to be present where the sisters were. How did she expand into the other countries? I, mean, I would say Mother Teresa, especially toward the ends of her life, went where there was a need. It could be an earthquake, it could be uh, a war, uh, extreme poverty. In the United States where scandals were taking place, clerical scandals, uh, where the church was being attacked, those were her priorities. She went to Russia, and doesn't she have a house or houses in Russia? She went to Russia because Mikhail Gorbachev saw my sister's documentary on Mother Teresa, which won first prize at the Moscow Film Festival. <laughs> and he's the one who arranged through the Soviet uh, Peace Committee, they invited Mother Teresa to Russia, Moscow. Wow. And then later, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, as uh, Mother Teresa said, in honor of the 15 decades of the Rosary at that time, she was going to open 15 houses in the different Soviet countries. <laughs> so, and she was always welcomed, as getting there through the church. You told me the story yeah. about uh, her communications uh, to Gorbachev oh. with regards to his... One day, uh, I was at the Mother House on September 29th, the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel. My companion priest was named was Michael. So I said, today, Father Michael and I had mass together. She, oh, I should send a note to uh, Mr. Gorbachev on his feast day. <laughs> she got out a piece of paper, wrote something in prayer, put it in an envelope, and she said, would you go to the consulate in Calcutta and deliver this message? <laughs> so I go there. Here's an American tapping on the door, probably cameras watching me from different countries, including India. And uh, they answer. And, um, and so some young man and woman were there. And they, I said, hello, my name is Father Petrie. I'm a Catholic priest. I'm from the United States. Uh, I'm a volunteer for Mother Teresa. I just met her. And... Um, she was reminded that it was the feast of St. Michael the Archangel, and I have a message here for Mr. Gorbachev. <laughs> oh, the personalities changed completely. <laughs> they were filled with smiles. Come in, come in, come in. And uh, they brought me to a sitting room. They brought down three or four other officials and uh, uh, I shared the note. They were delighted. Got a cup of tea, some snacks, and then... Uh, I think my reward was, when the sisters were established in Moscow, um, they have an annual retreat. Mm -hmm. And Mother Teresa asked me to go to give the retreat. So when I went to the Russian consulate, there was no problem. I was welcomed <laughs> with open arms as someone uh, who in some way had sensitivity to Mr. Gorbachev. That's an amazing story. Day. It Simply is. Simply an amazing story. What was your experience in India? Because besides the work that you did directly for Mother Teresa, uh, you're with the Congregation of Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary. And uh, as a result of that, uh, you undertook another, another mission uh, in India. What the was that The time came uh, after I was there for 15 years, the congregation said, it is time for us to recruit people from the country where we're at, mm -hmm. uh, to share our charism, mm -hmm. Father Damien, the Sacred Heart Spirituality, Eucharistic Devotion, Adoration, 
reparation. And so it was taking candidates and starting that formation process. I see. And when I left in the year 2000, we had our first ordinations. Wow. And the people to take over the work. So the purpose of a missionary really is to help establish the local church. That's right. And yes. that they would be in charge as soon as possible. And it meant also that if they had to get hold of the work, I had to leave because I was like the guru for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, my will, my decisions, my projects would be, everyone would agree with me. <laughs> and so by me not being there, they had to take the bull by the horns and say, we can do this. And it has worked out perfectly. How did you find the patients, uh, the people who needed the care, and, and how did you deal with them, and what were some of the results of the care that was given by the missionaries of charity? For my, people? The first three years, I was in this leprosy center called Chanti Nagar, meaning City of Peace. So that introduced me to actual contact with the patients, mm -hmm. the situation they were in, besides the disease, what were they suffering? Mm -hmm. Rejection was probably the priority that most of them had, besides poverty. Yeah. At that time, in the early 70s, the multi-drug therapy had not been developed. Or not yet. Yeah. Not yet, that didn't, it was being experienced not until the 1980s mm -hmm. did that come. Mm -hmm. And so people were fatalistic. They got um, this drug, the mm -hmm. uh, um, that would arrest the disease, mm -hmm. but couldn't cure it completely. Mm -hmm. So there was always the fear and superstition attached to it. Mm -hmm. I got this disease because of my sinfulness of my past life. You know, the, funny. And I came with the good news. All you have to do is take this medicine and you will be cured. <laughs> And God does not punish like that. And so my introduction was going into what I called rehabilitation work. They did not have to stay at the level in which they were living. Mm -hmm. We could raise the bar. Okay. We could teach the women skills, be self-supporting. It was basically weaving. Mm -hmm. We could teach the men certain skills, carpentry, blacksmithy at the time they would not follow the path of their parents to be mm -hmm. street beggars. Okay. And with that, development came. So over my 25 years, I worked with two generations going on the third, and I could see the change in their life. Wow. And they could see the change in their life. And that had an impact. It had an impact on me because like Mother Teresa, she said, I'm only a pencil that God is writing with. Mm -hmm. And I felt the same thing. I didn't go there. I went into construction of houses for hope and hope, uh, homeless leprosy patients. Yes. During my stay, maybe a thousand houses. Not just building the house, but working with the government to get land, to get the deed. Uh, at the same time, working with the women, the school, non-formal education, keeping up weekly clinics getting doctors to come in to help with uh, minor operations, things like that. And so I thought to myself, I couldn't have planned this. <laughs> I never in a thousand years came here to do what I am doing now. And it was constantly being used, people coming to assist, or donations being given to the church mm -hmm. that allowed this to happen. Wow. And when Mother won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, part of that money went for homeless leprosy patients mm -hmm. building houses. Fantastic. Yes. Fantastic. And that's why she accepted the money on behalf of the poor. Otherwise, she didn't want that award. Uh, well, she made it clear in uh, your sister's uh, video that when it came to fundraising, uh, somebody had come up to her and said, I want to fundraise for you. Yeah. She told them in no uncertain terms. That's right. 
do not do it in my name. Yes. You do it in your name. And yes. If you want to give it to us, that's fine. Yes. Is that the approach that, that she did? That was the approach that she did. And I followed that, meaning um, we had to build a seminary. We had to uh, pay for the tuition for the students going to the seminary, their college education. And uh, the money came. And she always mm -hmm. said, don't worry about the money. If you're doing God's work, it will come. And that was a prophecy fulfilled. So when you look back on this and you uh, would uh, say there were many, many challenges, but like, what were some of the top challenges that uh, the missionaries of charity and Mother Teresa in particular faced in, in India? Well, there is always because basically it is a non-Christian country, there's always suspicion about the church and mm -hmm. conversions. Mother Teresa treated everyone the same. You are a child of God. Okay. You are, for me right now, you are the person of Christ. Okay. And um, without any discrimination of caste, creed, culter, uh, cult, uh, color, she worked. And that has an overpowering experience. Mm -hmm. But she had to prove that. Yes. Until that time, uh, the sisters were looked upon with suspicion. I now, see. when are they going to convert us? When do we have to start believing in Jesus? So that was what that was one challenge. Uh, she also had a good number of critics. Yes. Critics who were not happy with the policies she had. For example, she believed their vocation was hands-on, poorest of the poor. Mm -hmm. So she'd build a shed, she'd put up a pandal, she would um, get donations of medical supplies. And volunteers would come and say, well, mother, why aren't you getting better medicine? Why are you taking some outdated things here? Mm -hmm. Why are you keeping the patients at this level when you can build a beautiful hospital? Why can't you give better medical treatment by hiring more doctors? Things like that. Mother would say, that's not our work. That's the work of another organization. I see. Our work is this. And so she did not raise the bar. And it's still. Well, in fact, didn't she actually say at some point in time, True humility means you can be to accept all the criticism and all the praise and be just to keep doing what you're doing. Yes. She had this aspect of humility as part of her being. Yes. She was the most humble person possible. There was, um, you know, when there was um, a profession at the sister's place, a concelebrated mass, we would have tea after biscuits. Mother Teresa insisted she had to pour the tea, she had to distribute the biscuits or the cookies, whatever it was. She had to collect the cups and saucers. Other sisters could have done it, mm -hmm. but no, she had to do it. Well, they also have a kind of a process in India of putting lays, what we call right. lays here, on, on, yes. the, on her head. She would just take it and take, take it, it right off, off and give it to a, to a sister. So she, yes. she looked at that as uh, I don't need that. She, um, and, and those lays went to the tabernacle, to a statue of our Blessed Mother, things like that, until they died. So it was true. Um, there was nothing, the quality of the material of the clothes she wore, she was at, she accepted, so St. Paul says, to be all things to all people. Okay. So in the morning, mm -hmm. She could be with the governor of the state. She could make a visit to the White House. In the afternoon, she's working with AIDS patients. She's dealing with street women uh, to find a shelter for them, women who were abused in some way. And the governor got the same treatment that the poorest of the poor got. A big smile, a look with God's love in her eyes, and uh, no discrimination. She was a person who was totally inclusive. You told me the story of her meeting with uh, Rajiv Gandhi. 
Yes. What was that about? When my <clears throat> congregation decided to uh, start our formation seminary program, she said, we have to do this right. We have to let the government know. Mm -hmm. So she said, let's go to Delhi and see the prime minister. Okay. <laughs> and she had a pass on Air India. Okay. Uh, so she said, you go down to the airport and um, I'll show you uh, my pass and uh, book a ticket for the both of us tomorrow. Okay. So a few minutes later, a sister comes in with a framed letter from the president of India <laughs> saying Mother Teresa is a person who will get free transportation on Air India. So I felt sorry. I said, like, two tickets, one for Mother Teresa. I pull out the bag, my framed letter. <laughs> yeah. And so that's how we got to, to Delhi. Delhi. Okay. When we got to meet the Prime Minister, there was no appointment, he was busy. So they said, could you come before his day begins? Could you be here around 6.30 in the morning? Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa said, yes, that's no problem. So we went to the Prime Minister's house and it was a con conference room. Mm -hmm. We sat around the table. So it was Mother Teresa and her companion and myself. Um, Mother Teresa always traveled with a side bag, okay. just whatever personal items she felt. She always had like a kindergarten box with her pens and pencil in there. She always used pencil for writing letters. You know, at, she at did not time. believe in using word processors. No, and nothing like that. Like Everything that. was done by letter or uh, notes. So when they came, uh, we were sitting at the table, and I traveled. I had a little briefcase. They, they put their bags on the table, I put my bags on the table. And I guess security came in. And they said, Father, would you mind putting your bag on the floor? I said, absolutely not. Oh, and she said, I'll do too. They said, no, no, Mother, you keep your bag on the table. Well, she said, the Father has to do it. No, no, Mother, please. I said, no, so she accepted that. She was already friendly with the Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi's mother. Okay. Uh, and Sonia, uh, before she was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And uh, she knew the family. So he knew her. Okay. Sort of grew up when she was friends with the mother. Yes. Indira. And um, so he comes into the room with a big smile on his face. Mother, I'm so happy to see you. Uh, whatever you want, you're going to get. <laughs> So she says, I have a present for you. And he said, what is it? And she pointed to me and said, here he is. <laughs> well, talk about being humbled. You know. And he looked and he said, mother, what do you mean by that? And then she said, well, he belongs to the same order as Father Damien. And they're involved in leprosy work here in India. And he knew about Father Damien. He went to a, a Christian school. Catholic and then an Episcopal school. Mm -hmm. And so he wants to start the congregation. Rajiv Gandhi said, Mother, isn't there enough Indian priests? <laughs> and she said, yes, but not with the charism of Father Damien's congregation. Uh, we need Father Damien's congregation in India. With that, he took her application sign, gave it to an assistant, and I was able to start the program without any difficulties, legalities uh, from the government. Amazing story, Father. Yeah. So uh, if, if, um, if you could take a look at those 25 years and your association with Mother Teresa and the things that she did, what do you think is her legacy? Her legacy is, um, you know, some college students were asked, what is the most important word in the English language? And the majority wrote love. Okay. For Mother Teresa, she was love personified. She was so much in union with the person of Jesus, she radiated him. There was like a vibration. There was a feeling when you were in front of her, and this is like 25 years association, <laughs> thinking to yourself, this is special, this peace that I'm getting, this joy that I'm having just being in her presence. And so what it was, she lived a legacy of love 
and she was able to communicate it. What it was, was her love for Jesus, total love for Jesus. And I like to use the example, there's a famous painting of Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. And under the cross, there is a chalice collecting the blood of Jesus that came from the side. And um, it's overflowing. Mm -hmm. And it goes into a stream and trickles down. It's ultimately going to end up in the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. I like to think of the words when Mary said at Cana, do what he tells you. And Jesus said, fill the jugs with water. And it says, they filled them to the brim. Okay. Mother Chisa was a chalice filled to the brim, filled with God's love, which overflows into people, into her works, ultimately into the world. Uh, what is the current status of the Missionaries of Charity and of your order, the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary, uh, in the work that is doing uh, in India and, and, and in other places? Yes. The, um, when Mother died, there were 4,000 sisters. She was in 125 countries. Mm -hmm. Now. There are 5,000 sisters since 1997, mm -hmm. 5,500, as you said, and she is in 131 countries. People said to her, probably when you die, the work will end. Donations will not come anymore. And so she died, donations continue, the vocations continue. So it worked. It wasn't her work. It was God's work. For myself, we ended up with two seminaries in India, uh, one a program for philosophy for seminarians and the other for theology. Mm -hmm. uh, we have over 20 priests. Uh, our seminary both have abundant candidates and they will become missionaries. So the legacy I had was the leprosy work. We're also involved in parishes, involved in giving retreats. And, we're involved in being foreign missionaries too. Mm -hmm. And all this, our new Indian priest will be following that charism. Well, I can't resist asking you one more question. And that is, your life went full circle because the way I see it is you were inspired by Father Damien and you wind up being pastor. I'm uh, saying <laughs> Damien Church on topside Molokai. Uh, I said, this was God's humor. <laughs> you know, that. when I left India, mm -hmm. I came to ask if I could spend six months on Molokai as a sabbatical, sort of decompressurize, start processing everything I experienced mm -hmm. in 25 years. And I had that permission. And after the six months, suddenly there was a need, and they needed a pastor uh, at the Catholic Church in Lahaina, Maui. One of the most beautiful, quaint towns, cruise ships coming every day, uh, a real tourist destination, the hotels, the families that come there, palm trees in the wind, uh, the church walking distance to the ocean, uh, the most loving Hawaiian aloha spirit you can imagine. And I said, I can't believe this. Here I was with the poorest of the poor, and I feel I'm in five-star luxury. What uh, humor Mother Teresa has. And that was my reward, so to speak. Then I had to go back to the mainland, and there were some uh, assignments that I had. Okay. And then the opportunity came. They needed a pastor in Topside St. Damien Church, mm -hmm. and I was only too happy to walk in the footsteps. He built, we think of just Kalapapa yes. down below. Yes. But he built several churches, topside also. Oh, didn't know he that. He used to climb, he got there. Uh, that, 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 that path and everything, yes. a switchback. And um, the poly and um, two of them are still there. So to say mass in that church, the rectory mm -hmm. was right next to one of the churches. I see. And, uh, just very sacred. I'm walking 
where Damien buried people, where his legacy was, as well as down below. So he was in both places. And uh, again, you think, all my assignments, I had this. I can do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> and then God comes and intervenes. Now, I leave there because canonically, at the age of 75, bishops and pastors are to resign. I see. You're not resigning from the priesthood. You're still saying mass. You're helping out. You're doing that. But administratively, you know, even the cardinals have to do that. Mm -hmm. They do it at 80. They can't vote for the pope the time they reach 80. So um, when it came 75, mm -hmm. I said, here I am, Lord. I come to do your will. I end up here in Honolulu at mm -hmm. St. Patrick's Monastery. They need someone for uh, being chaplain to our Sacred Heart Sisters who run Sacred Hearts Academy, where I go every day for Mass. Mm -hmm. And I am available to help out in our parishes or other, which brings me to Star of the Sea right now. And we're very thankful for that. And I that is the Holy Ghost, <laughs> for is. sure. There we go. <laughs> and so, uh, and I'm saying, well, I can spend the rest of my life here. Um, when I turn 80, I think life begins at 80. So I'm looking forward to that. I turn 80 this year. So what is going to happen, God only knows. And maybe Mother Teresa and Father David. Aloha, Father. Aloha, Leo. It uh, is nice to have this uh, follow-up session here uh, on our project talking about Mother Teresa. And what I thought we would do today is to focus in on the human side of Mother Teresa. Okay. What kind of a person she was, both in the context of her public activities with, with the sisters and on her own. Okay. For me, when I am asked that question, I spontaneously say she was like her grandmother. You couldn't find, you know, the children um, have to be disciplined by their parents, but the grandparents have the liberty <laughs> to be more loving, kind, generous, uh, available, and those are the qualities that Mother Teresa had. Even in her young age, she would have been called auntie by the young children, and then as it, uh, she grew older, naturally mother, and then uh, they never called her Didi, which would have been the word in India for grandparent, but uh, her loving kindness, generosity, um, smile, uh, a tenderness in movement. So she wasn't rushing around or doing this. There was a gentleness all the time about her. Well, speaking of that, uh, in terms of her movement and her actions, one of the things I noticed is that she never shook hands. Yes. With, and she seldom embraced. Yes. So was that due to the fact that she had moved to India and adopted the culture? The culture. Yes. Um, you know, the heritage of India goes back thousands of years and its evolution. But part of it was, especially, although it is not legal anymore, the classification of castes, there's a, a leftover of that where it was not common uh, to shake hands ever in that Indian culture, but the pranam, the God in me expecting the God in you. And it's a very beautiful gesture. Mm -hmm. Southeast Asia has it, the Buddhists have it. And um, even when she came to the West, the United States, when she met big people, the big crowd, and very rarely did she shake hands. And to tell you the truth, I never saw her embrace anyone, including the sisters. It was always this or the blessing, you know, and they had. So the blessing, how did that, how did that work? I, when you were in Mother Teresa's presence, this is something, uh, 
that is yet to be uh, really developed. We speak about vibration, we speak about frequency, we speak about chemistry between people. Mother had all three. <laughs> so when you were in her presence, you felt something. Now, it was already scientifically studied that when she gave a talk, the audience went into a state of alpha, the brainwave, totally relaxed, at peace. And it was her voice, it was her presence. And so that frequency, that vibration, that chemistry, when she touched you like this, mm -hmm you felt you got a blessing. She didn't say any prayer, it was just, it's just like the ordination. The ordination to the priesthood comes, there's no prayer. There's prayers uh, in the rite, and then the actual time comes for the ordination, the bishop just lays his hands on mm -hmm. the candidate. And it's, see that in the scripture, when they chose Barnabas to take place of Judas, when they had this, they laid hands on them and sent them forth. And so every priest that attends the ordination, after the bishop, everyone comes up and lays hands. And I think um, there's something to that, that the priest really feels it. I know I did when I was ordained, and I know the sisters. Basically, her blessings was just for the sisters. But if there's someone sick in the hospital or something, she would. Uh... One day, I started to get a little lump in the side of my uh, uh, face here. I thought it was just a pimple. And I've got them before. I wait till they ripen them and I squeeze it. <laughs> anyway, she noticed it one time. And she said, what about that? I said, oh, I don't think it's just a pimple and it'll go away. And she said to me, can I touch it? <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> and all she did, she did this. And then she said, um, I'm going to call a doctor I know, and I want you to see him to remove that. And I did. And of course, they sent to see if it was cancerous. It wasn't. If it was, <laughs> I think Mother Teresa's touch healed me. <laughs> Following up on that. So she dealt with the poorest of the poor, the people who were dying in the streets. She dealt with uh, the volunteers and the sisters in the mother house and in the, in the homes. And she dealt with the public uh, in her public interactions. And she dealt with the authorities at the highest levels, whether it's the Nobel Peace Prize, whether it's the, the General Assembly, whether it was a president, uh, a queen or a king or a princess. How did she, did she treat each of those parties differently, or was it to her the same? It was complete uniformity. You could be the richest person, the most powerful person, and she met both of those types, or the poorest. And do you know what I, I, it's the highest possible respect, I think, that she would give. So that when she saw someone, one time I was, uh, meeting her at the airport and it was toward the end of her life and she was being wheeled out uh, in the chair, wheelchair and I was at the uh, entrance where the wheelchair was going to come and I was just standing there and I had my pranam to greet her. Already halfway down the corridor she was smiling and oh sort of like that <laughs> to see her. And so when she was with people, sometimes, oh, yes, you know, it was with a smile. Uh, not too often do we see mother smiling. Um, people like to get her in a natural pose or when she's in a difficult situation of famine or earthquake or war, she, naturally she's more serious. But she smiled a lot. Did she have a sense of humor? Yes but she was a poor joke teller. <laughs> she cried, and everyone would laugh after her so-called joke, uh, which was never that funny, and uh, it was, oh yeah, yeah. But um, she wanted to make other people happy. 
So, are you feeling okay? Okay. <laughs> you know, something like that. <laughs> and he said, is it okay if I give you this glass of water? Uh, okay? <laughs> you know, something like that. So there was a personal style she had. I don't think she realized it, but it's the question and she giving the answer. And I think that would catch everyone by surprise, first of all. So if it was someone dying, you know, she mentioned this sometime, to wash, bathe that person, to sit with that person until they actually die. Mm -hmm. In her later years, after she imparted that style of presence, of healing, with dealing different dimensions of the poor, she didn't have, she wasn't working five hours a day in a ward. There was administrative things, there was mm -hmm. meetings, there was prayers, there was talks, there was the um, formation for the young sisters, but always visiting priests to the mother house and say, we say mass, she'd want to go to his mass. There could be two or three masses during the day. And she got so much out of that. Mm -hmm. You ask someone else and they say, oh no, I meant mass this morning. <laughs> you know, that, that was a mother, oh, there's another mass today. <laughs> you know, it was that type of thing. To encounter the real presence in the holy sacrifice of the mass was the reality. And uh, that overflowed to whether it was children. Uh, when she picked up a baby, and um, uh, she talked baby talk. Oop, 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 yip, 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 yip. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and the child is doing that, the baby's doing that, and she answers in the same way. Now, I never knew that, but when my sisters were recording one time, when uh, she had the microphone off, mm -hmm. and the one, Listen, I don't believe what I'm hearing. Mother's going, whoop, 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 whoop. And uh, that was the personal style. She knew how to relate. So if it was a baby, if it was a dying person, if it was a leprosy patient, and not to mention the people who came to her, and they're asking, Mother, I need money. She, didn't, she wasn't a person for dispensing money. Mm -hmm. She was dispensing clothes. She was dispensing food. Mm -hmm. At 12 o'clock, we'll have be feeding people. And whether that was in a third world country or New York City, when they uh, opened up mercy kitchens in New York or the AIDS patients, it wasn't money. Uh, you know, especially in the beginning with the AIDS epidemic, um, it was some medicine, nothing else you could do. Mm -hmm. So in New York City, uh, where she had AIDS patients, she probably had room for about 10 in an old rectory that was given to her by the diocese. And just down the street was a 100-bed facility for AIDS patients. Now, in the beginning, if you got AIDS, AIDS you were going to die. Mm -hmm. And so it was sort of there, it was loose living in that the AIDS patients could go out if they weren't suffering pain, they could go to the bars and things. But they had a place to stay, a place where medicine was controlled. There was an option that the government gave if you wanted to stay with Mother Teresa's sisters. Cool. And that entailed, no matter what your religion, <laughs> rosary in the morning, attending Father's Mass, no television, you have to learn how to talk together, you know, be together for half hour, 45 minutes after meal. We're gonna pray before the meal, pray after the meal. Well, when you're in that atmosphere of people praying, it did something, no one wanted to leave there. Wow. And I think it was a gift for those who would uh, go there. Now, most of the people, believe it or not, who chose to go there of all the types of AIDS patients were usually drug addicts. Big, tough, strong people to be frightened to meet on the street who did their damage in life. And they're the ones who appreciated that atmosphere. Why? That's a good question. It is. It is. Now, moving up to dealing with the sisters, 
there were, there were the pleasant moments, there were the decision moments, there were the moments where she had to unfortunately perhaps even say, this is not for you. That's right. How did she deal with those type of situations with her sisters? I think the same way that she dealt with people uh, who pleaded with mother, please, I need this money for paying a debt. I need this money for this and that. And mother would be able to give a response that was really negative. No, mm -hmm. it's not possible. Mm -hmm. And the person go away happy. Mm. Okay. So that's, so in her explanation, that would be. So even for the sisters, definitely they would be hurt. They take vows uh, and renew them each year for uh, nine years. And so at any time when the vows expire, if the four majors recommend it, maybe the sister shouldn't go on. She doesn't seem to have a, a missionary charity vocation. Often it would be mother in the beginning who would have to be the one in charge to speak to that person and tell them. Okay. She would much rather try to um, bring an insight to change them. Sister, you've got to be more patient. You um, have to do it this way. You have to, uh, and um, some could do that. Some she held up. So when it's time for final vows and they wanted to make their complete commitment, she say, would say, I think you have to, I think we should wait one more year. Oh, wow. That hurt sisters immensely. And I could identify with that. And um, it was such a thing, uh, such a powerful thing, how she was able to do it. And after they finally take the final vows, you forget about that. What's one more year? It's nothing. And so mother came across as a person who uh, did it, and it hurts, and that becomes a challenge for that individual uh, to see it as a prayer, to see it as a sacrifice, to see it as the Holy Spirit's working through another person. Mm -hmm. It is strengthening your faith. Or if your ego gets in the way, it's okay. This is enough for me. I'm going. That's it. I'm fed up. You know, you can do the uh, negative. Before I forget, she left her family to join the Sisters of Loreto. Um, and I think I read she That's never right. saw the family again. She what? She never saw her, fam her mother saw and her sister. Family again. How did she, how did she, did she ever talk about the, this aspect of... Oh. She, with the few sentences that she would say, um, you know, when she tried to go back to um, Albania, um, you know, at that time, Yugoslavia, whatever it was, and, uh, or that there was people of the church who were willing to pay for her mother and sister to go to India to visit her. Mm -hmm. and the government wouldn't allow it. Would, not, would allow. not allow them to leave, would not allow mother to go. And um, she would just say, oh, I would have loved to. Never happened, something like that. Mm -hmm. And you could see, almost see tears would well up in her eyes. So after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union, do we use that word collapse? I yes, I think I, I love it. <laughs> okay, after... Uh, the Soviet Union countries were sort of liberated or something. One of the first things was to go to Albania. And uh, my sister coming to One of the things was to go to the grave of her oh. parents, uh, of her sister, uh, of uh, her mother, mm -hmm. and prayed. And um, an arrangement was made that a nice tombstone could be put on their grave. And after waiting 50 years or something, you know, that's the closest she could get to her oh, mother wow. and sister. Yeah. But the love was there. So she only had one brother, and he is 
left, I was going to say escape, maybe that's the <laughs> word, uh, went to Italy. And uh, he got married and um, um, had um, one daughter. She got married and there are two sons. So the only living relative would be her niece and the two sons. Oh, right I here. see. I see. And um, they came to her funeral. They were at the beatification. They were, uh, and she said, even though she was Mother Teresa, uh, to me she was like my, they like my, our mother. Wow. You know, that was the thing. Even though the contact was never uh, living with them, or vice versa. But for the few hours or the few days when they met, a very strong bond. Wow. That's really cool. What do you think are some of the universal principles to carry on and meet the test of time? Mother Teresa was chosen by God. There are so many religious orders, so many sisters doing the same thing. And they're prayerful and they're saints. And so mother would be challenged by certain individuals to say, uh, mother, what's going to happen after you die? The sisters don't have any income. How are these works going to be maintained? And she said, well, if all of this is because of me, it will end. And if it's because of God, it will continue. And that sustainability is there. But it's not something that they want to brag about, that they want to talk about, that they want to say, see, we told you. It is something that is just going low key. Mother Teresa was used by God. She knew it. But she didn't let any of the other sisters be used in the same way. Okay. A media person, spokesperson, guest speaker, meeting top people around the world. And they've all followed that. That was Mother. So after Mother died, Harvard University uh, wrote to Sister Nirmala, who is the Superior General, inviting her to be a keynote speaker, one of the graduations. And uh, Sister Nirmala uh, re re expressed her gratitude but she said, no, I won't be able to do it. And they said, well, Mother Teresa should do it. She said, but I'm not Mother Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be the sisters. Uh, there's just one boss that God chose. And so what she wanted was to always keep the sisters humble, that they would never go beyond uh, the lifestyle of the poor, whether it was in uh, physical presence. For example, even during Lent, when they had fast days, um, it would be maybe no food, but the money they saved would have bought the rice and everything, mm -hmm. was put aside, and that was sort of given to very needy people at a certain time. There was just so many humble ways that the sisters would uh, practice that humility that mother had when you saw her pray uh, down. She always took the invitation to speak at forums because she was doing it on behalf of the poor. But she saw that was her job. Oh, I see. Not the sisters. Mm -hmm. I was speaking. And, remember. and so today, since she died in 1997, uh, the sisters are growing, a thousand more sisters. Um, several more countries, I think about seven or eight more countries. Under, when she died, it was 125. I think it's 131, 132 now. Mm -hmm. It's not over yet. And an own quiet way doing it, being present. And that's what Mother Teresa saw their vocation. Uh, following up on that, on that point, so the poorest of the poor, the one with the physical problems, she talked about the poor, the people who basically are suffering from loneliness and being rejected in that vein. So those, I mean, in those two categories, you can see uh, places that are third world or wherever where you have those people who are uh, physically uh, that way and are not cared for and rejected. We also have those in the United States. 
Uh, and certainly we have what we see in society happening today, the people who are so lonely and, and desperate that they turn to malbehavior and those kinds of things. So what was the, what, what was the, what was the, the approach in the development of going out and helping those uh, physically uh, problems and then turning attention to those who suffered a greater poverty in terms of loneliness? That's the word she would use, greater poverty here in the West. She always would say, we can uh, meet the needs of the poor in developing countries or where there is uh, urgency and emergency requirements by feeding them, by clothing them, by giving some basic medical attention. But she said here it is much worse because they are rejected. Uh, they don't feel they're loved. Uh, they are alone. Uh, no one is supporting them. And even if it is a support, it could be a welfare check. Mm -hmm. It could be food stamps. That isn't satisfying what they are experiencing. So when uh, leprosy patients would ask me, uh, you mean you have poor people and they got a car, a telephone, a television, uh, they got clothes, they got go to go to school, uh, they got food, and you call them poor. But they are poor because psychologically they know I'm at the bottom. Yeah. And uh, there's no one there with me. That's where Mother Teresa would reach out to those. So in like cities of New York, big cities, where the sisters aren't working um, say looking after the children and the elderly, they do house visiting. And they go to these uh, high-rise buildings, studios, one-room apartments, uh, an elderly man or something, they're not sweeping the floor, There's not, they're not emptying out the garbage, and that's what the sisters do. They go there, and uh, I think in one of my sister's interviews, uh, the sisters are uh, sweeping. And the lady there says, oh, you don't have to do that. I did it already. And there's a big pile of crumbs. <laughs> and there was cans and half used and half not. And she said, I'm not finished with that yet or something. <laughs> and so the sisters, without belittling, would come down to the state of mind that person was and say, oh, but I think it's bad now. Oh, you do? Is it OK to throw it away? Get permission from the the elderly person, that type of dignity. And she would say, oh, you people are so good. That was one of the interviews. So definitely in the West. And even as she went in op these former uh, Eastern Bloc countries, they have been, um, I hate to say the word program, they've yes. been educated. Program. Indoctrinated. Yeah, yeah. indoctrinated. And there's a coldness of heart she would feel. There's just something there that was lost. And so how do you change that? Well, you can't. But by her presence there, by opening up one house, by opening a house in Siberia, does that satisfy the suffering of all the people there? No, but that house is there. It's a sign of hope. It is a sign that they're being prayed for. It's a sign that there's a bigger organization supporting the sisters who are there and that they'll always be there and that they're not going to go away. Wow. That's important. That's yeah. important. It is. That's right. Now, sisters might be transferred for one reason or another, but if they learnt the language, you know, the transfers aren't as rapid. Oh, I see. But for the Indian sisters, God has blessed them with right-sided brain power and they can pick up a language. And the way they do it, they start learning the Our Father and the Hail Mary first. <laughs> and once they can say the rosary, then they take their Bible, uh, start with Genesis in the beginning, God made them, and they look at it in Russian, <laughs> and <laughs> that's how they learn a language. They are very good because a lot of the call centers <laughs> I see. are in India. They That's can, right. I'm sure they deal in every language That's in the right. world. Okay. There are. 
So um, just to answer your question, there's just something about the style that they can meet, whether it was in Siberia or Mongolia, whether it's in Afghanistan or Iraq, whether it's in Jordan, Palestine, you just, all the trouble spots. She's not afraid to go to the trouble spots. And very rarely is there um, a reaction. Four sisters were killed, you know, in Yemen. Yes. And um, that was unusual. And it was a hate crime. Mm -hmm. The terrorists, they couldn't compete with what the sisters were doing. What were they doing? Just loving elderly, destitute people and poor children. That's all. And living with them. It's like a family. And so what was interesting about that of the five, there was five sisters. Mm -hmm. One sister hid behind the door. And she thought, she was praying because she thought she'd be shot next. Mm -hmm. And uh, the troops came in and they saw the room empty and they didn't look behind the door. Wow. Well, the sister said, God wanted to keep me alive because I can witness to what happened. Wow. And what, what each one went through and how it all took place and how we were overcome and things like that. And I believe that. And um, that sister, you know, goes to uh, where they have houses formation and gives talk, speaking about the charism of Mother Teresa that she felt she was living mm -hmm. being in Yemen. Um, I might have been one of them. What? In this sense, that when I was in India, Mother Teresa says we're invited. It's 99.9% uh, .9 Muslim country, but we're invited to open a house and there's no Catholic priest there. Would your congregation be willing to go? And Mother looked at me and I said, Mother, I would go, but I'm just starting to work here. She said, oh, no, no, you're needed here. Wow. But she did that before in <laughs> Vietnam. Do you think you could uh, stay here? I mean, stay there, not get back on the plane. That's how <laughs> Jesus. Mother, I said, we've got our own formation. We've got the leprosy I'm involved in. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> so she uh, did that uh, style. But she always found someone. And the priest was not killed. He was um, killed as a hostage for about two years. Wow. And uh, he was a Salesian father. And uh, ultimately, negotiations took place. But it was a transaction where the Salesian community had to pay money oh, wow. to the people in Yemen. And, uh, and they did it through the Salesians because the governments wouldn't do that. Indian government doesn't pay like hostage, American government doesn't pay, but they allowed the church. Maybe they gave a donation to the Catholic <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Father, favorite story of uh, Mother Teresa? Favorite Favorite one. <laughs> story. Okay. I am going with my companion priest to a meeting from Calcutta. We're traveling to Tokyo where the meeting is going to be held for our missionaries in Asia. And we were told for this meeting, <clears throat> it is possible to bring two duty-free bottles of alcohol. <laughs> and they suggested that all the participants who were coming to, if we wanted wine with our meal, uh, to bring a couple of bottles of wine. So I am with my companion who doesn't drink, never goes into the duty free. And I said, well, give me your ticket so I can get your two bottles and my two bottles. And so I did, I had four bottles. They put it in a white plastic bag. Sometimes you, know, you can't see what's in the bag. Yeah. So there I am in collar, carrying this bag with four bottles. I'm walking down to get back on the plane, and all of a sudden I hear, Father Petrie, Father Petrie. <laughs> I said, I don't believe it. Who in Hong Kong knows me? I turn around, and there is Mother Teresa <laughs> with another sister <laughs> being interviewed. <laughs> so I had to go over and acknowledge her, so I go there with my four bottles of alcohol, <laughs> and uh, 
She looks at it and she says, what is that? And I said, well, it's not cough medicine. <laughs> and then I said, you know, we're having a meeting and uh, we were recommend advised to bring a couple bottles, bring our duty free quota, uh, we have wine with the meals. And then she looks and then she says, how many are attending the meeting? <laughs> so I said, probably, there will be about 30 or 40. She said, okay. <laughs> and that was, so that's one of my favorite stories. This is in Hong Kong. This, this, is, this is in Hong Kong where you go to. That's yeah. amazing. Who? You know, 8 million people in Hong Kong. Uh, who would you meet on the, on the airport? airport? Yeah. Me calling, I didn't believe it. Who, who do I know in Hong Kong? I said. So that was a great story to bring to the meeting. So, Father, uh, just one more thing, one more request, and that is I'm sure there was an ending prayer to meetings or to yes. things that were said. Could you, could you say that for us, please? An ending prayer, Mother was always spontaneous. She had her little prayer book. There was a prayer for everything, for every need, different litanies for every day, uh, different prayers for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, dedicated to the saints. Real beautiful devotional prayers. And I have that little book. Mm -hmm. It is something that is uh, precious in that there are prayers that maybe have been dropped along the way. People speak spontaneous prayers and prayer from the heart, all very good. Mother Teresa, at the end of the meeting, she would bless herself and she would say, oh Jesus, thank you for this meeting. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit upon us. Uh, whatever we discuss, may it be for your greater honor and glory. May what we have learned be a strength for us to bring your love to the world. And these prayers we offer through Jesus, your Son, our Lord. Amen. That would be extemporaneous Mother Teresa prayer. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. You're welcome. It was my joy, my privilege. And I do it because I just feel it's part of a legacy I have received.